<laughs> Welcome to Firsts in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Walton Gansky, the author of uh, numerous novels and nonfiction books. I'm Molly Jo Really. I am producer of the podcast, and I am author of The Unemployment Cookbook and the upcoming mystery location novel, NOLA. And it occurs to me that I've got another novel coming out next month, less, less than a month away, called Who is Harrison Sawyer? I, I should probably be doing a better job of publicizing that. So, hey, that just occurred to me, and here I am publicizing it. So um, my intro might be getting too long. I might have to start cutting back. Uh, but uh, I'll keep you posted on on uh, some some information on that when I start planning book launches and things of that nature. Uh, I'll be sure to let you guys know. And you are probably noticing, if all is going properly, uh, our new look here at Firsts in Fiction Live, uh, AaronGansky.com slash Firsts in Fiction Live. Uh, this is going to be the only address you will need moving forward to join in on our live broadcasts or in our chat. Uh, you'll notice just beneath the video here, there is a chat room which you can log into and you can do that using your Facebook account or various other accounts um, or you can sign up for a new account with, uh, I think it's called Wing Chat or Chat Wing or something like that. Um, you can it's sign chat up. Chat Wing. Chat wing, so you can sign up for that if you want, uh, but uh, you can probably, easiest just to do it through Facebook and the like. You'll see Molly and I have said something there. Uh, we would love for you to be able to participate in the chat room um, and keep those comments coming. We'll, we will continue to monitor those as we have um, in the past, and you don't even need a new update. Just every Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, first, uh, aaronganski.com slash live. And uh, there it'll be. And you can just click on that and, and watch us. And so we're hoping this works out. A bit of a, a, a test for us today. Let us know what you think. The other thing that you will notice is down at the very bottom of our page here is a link to subscribe to our mailing list. And uh, in the efforts of trying to improve how we get the word out to our listeners uh, that we've got a new cast coming up, um, email seems to be a good choice for several of you. So we, uh, we've put together a newsletter so that we can keep in touch with you and let you know what's coming up and um, answer questions and things of that nature. So don't forget to sign up for that. And if you are watching on YouTube live or if you're watching on YouTube later, please be sure to click that thumbs up button. And again, uh, go ahead and subscribe to us. Helps, helps us out quite a bit. Helps us keep mm -hmm. things free. Um, and you always like free content. So Oh my goodness, that was a mouthful. Um, I think we're done with uh, the let me, let me add this though, uh, Aaron, real quick. Yeah. Uh, when it's First in Fiction's live, there's hyphens uh, in between First in Fiction and live, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Okay, hyphens so between all the words. Yeah, it's not one word, one long word. It's uh, first hyphen in hyphen fiction hyphen live. Uh, best thing to do really, just go to AaronGansky.com. And there's a link on that uh, landing page. You click on it and you're there. You don't have to worry about the remainder of it. Mm. You can also bookmark it. Um, and that, that would be a fairly smart thing to do since we're hoping that you'll come back and join us each week. So you'll be using that link hopefully, hopefully uh, fairly often. I'm um, trying to make things easy for you. Now, let's turn our attention to the Ask the Author question, which comes in via email from Ann Sir. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's another it's another pseudonym for Jacqueline Patterson. Jacqueline's Jacqueline's a friend of mine. She sends me questions. So uh, she says, "Nano Rimo, beneficial or detrimental for writers?" Uh, good, good question. And thank you very much. Um, and for those of you who may not know or be familiar with Nano Rimo, it's short for National Novel Writing Month, which is observed annually. Uh, every November. And the goal is to write, a, I believe it's 50,000 words, which is the minimum for a novel, um, all written in the month of November. Uh, it's been around since 1999. That's when it first started. Uh, and that's when I first started. It got some good buzz for it. And that's when I started hearing things about it. I have never participated in it, um, which I'll explain in a little bit. But the question is, is it good or bad for writers? And I think it really depends on a lot of different things. My first inclination is to say that writing 50,000 words in a month is never a bad thing. Um, 
I think you have to keep your expectations reasonable. You may not hit 50,000 in a month and, and you need to be okay with that. Um, and if you do hit 50,000, you're probably writing a lot of really not good stuff. There's going to be a lot of pages that are just fluff because there's going to be times where you're just not in the zone as we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, but that much writing, I think is going to make you better. And I think that much consistent writing is going to help you kind of get into that zone. So you may not have a publishable draft at the end of the month. And if you think you're going to, um, you might want to realign your expectations. Um, but you should have a workable first draft, or at least if you're aiming for 100,000, a workable half of a first draft. Um, something that you can go back to and polish up and refine. Um, and I've actually known several people who have accomplished this, who've written a first draft in November um, and then have gone back and kind of fleshed things out a little bit. So um, I think that's all good. But I do worry that it can be too much pressure. Um, I've had a lot of students doing this and I'll assign homework and they just roll their eyes and whine and complain. Oh, I've got to write 15,000 words when I get home. Well, oh, that's not from me. <laughs> I didn't assign that. Don't get mad at me. Um, but they put a lot of pressure on themselves. And I think that if you put too much pressure on yourself, it's very possible that you're going to end up burning yourself out. And that's no good. Uh, what good is it to write 50,000 words in a month and then not write for the other 11 months? Um, on that note, if, you're, if, if NaNoWriMo does nothing else but teach you the fact that you need to prioritize your writing and you need to have a good writing schedule, then it's done its job, even if you don't hit that 50,000 words. Um, but my response has always been, because I've always had students, do you do NaNoWriMo, Mr. Gansky? And my answer is every month is NaNoWriMo for me. That's, I'm always writing. Um, I, I don't like the idea of, of prioritizing one month over the others to the detriment of the others. Uh, it's a year round sport. Uh, the great thing about writing is it will never be rained out. Um, there's no weather delays. It's just writing uh, and you can always do it. So, uh, do that 12 months out of the year is what I would say. So, you know, again, full disclosure, I've never participated in it. Um, I don't know that I'd be able to accomplish it quite honestly, not with the schedule that I have right now. I mean, I could, but my family would never see me. And then I'd probably have to hire a divorce lawyer and, uh, that's just, gets really expensive. So, um, I'd rather. And I mean, you'd lose anyway. <laughs> yeah. Even when I win, I lose. So, um, but for me, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm writing all, all, all the months. So how about you pops? Yeah, I have, uh, I have real mixed emotions about it. And you know me, I'm the curmudgeon of the group here. Um, and I know it's a big thing. Uh, this isn't even on my notes. Let me just depart from my own notes for a little bit. I think one thing our uh, viewers and our listeners need to understand is there's a huge industry teaching people who want to be writers how to be writers. Uh, there's a lot of books about how to write written by people who, well, that's the only book they've ever written was the How to Write book. Uh, there's some good ones out there, don't get me wrong, but it has become an incredible industry. And uh, the thing we're talking about now, this uh, national novel thing in uh, November, it's run by a nonprofit uh, organization, uh, but you are right in that it puts a lot of pressure on people. And that can uh, maybe run somebody off uh, because it's an artificial standard. You have to do 50,000 words in a month. Um, I don't think creativity works that way. It's, it's great for somebody who needs maybe a, a, a boot to the fanny to get going. But um, beyond that, I, I just have concerns um, because of you're, you're boxing yourself in, I think. So, you know, why not do 25,000 words in two months or split it up over three months? You know, do 16 or 17,000 words or so, whatever it might be to do that. That'll fit your schedule and come up with something that has quality at the end. Uh, and that you can use. So really what I would say, there's there's pluses and, and minuses to it. Some of us need to be pushed a little bit, but if you're not getting something at the end of that process that you can shop around, that you can turn into a, a longer book or whatever, then I'm wondering why I bother doing it, other than being able to say, hey, I, I wrote 50,000 words in a month. Um, in the, the professional world, I don't think anyone would care. Um, you know, I've written a 100,000 word novel in six weeks, so... Um, we just know that's sometimes uh, for the professional writer, you get stuck with stuff like that. So why embrace one? So I'm, I'm a little uh, more cautious about it. I've not participated in it, mostly because I had my own writing to do. Um, and so that's really one of my concerns. Uh, the other thing is, I think 
uh, writers, professional writers are self-motivated. We have to get up each morning, no matter how we feel, and we got to put our fanny in the chair, and we got to put our fingers on the keyboard, and we got to produce something. It doesn't matter whether we like it or not, or we'd rather be sleeping in late. We just have to do it. You make it sound like it's a job. Yeah, it kind of is a job. <laughs> it kind of okay. is a job. I can't remember who said it now. Uh, maybe somebody will be able to come up with it for me here. But someone said, um, I only write when I'm inspired. And fortunately, I'm inspired at 9 a.m. every morning, mm -hmm. um, whether I want to be or not. Uh, so the thing about being a writer, if you're going to do more than just produce one piece of work, uh, is that you have to be self-motivated and rather than be motivated by the outside. Now, if this gets you started, that's great. If you're working on a book that you plan to have published, that's great. Uh, if you're just writing 50,000 words to see if you can do it, I suggest not doing that. I suggest working on your work in progress on something you can sell with that. And there have been um, a number of people who have uh, written negative things about it. Uh, there's an article in Salon from 2010, and that'll be in the uh, show notes if you want to look that up. Um, so... It varies from person to person. I'm not here to slam them. I just, uh, it doesn't fit my way of thinking and my experience. So, you know, Pops, I, I really like many of the points that you were saying here, especially uh, the, the aspect of um, if you're going to use it, use it as an excuse to write something that you want to sell. Don't just write 50,000 words for the sake of writing 50,000 words. Make sure it's tied into whatever project you're currently on. I also was really impressed how you just casually slipped into the conversation that you wrote a hundred thousand word novel in, in six weeks. That was very, that was pro. I, um, I wasn't impressed with that. I was pressured by that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, well, I, I wrote 20,000 words in the last year and I was really happy. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> ask me if I want to do that again. Yeah. Do you want to do that again? No, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> um, in fact, the only reason I did it was, it was, uh, I think it was the first Struker book. And uh, he was still active military, so half my conversations were with him uh, on a business trip. That's all he would have, ever be able to tell me. So I'm assuming it's, you know, some place, some trouble spot that he was in since he was, uh, you know, active uh, army with that. So the time contracts got done and all that stuff was worked out, the due date was six weeks from when I started. So I didn't have a choice. It was get up in the morning and start pounding like crazy, um, and you know, till I got uh, till I got to the end of it. So. Uh, I've only done that once. I've written some in like a couple of months, but I've never enjoyed that. I was waiting for you to just start buffing your nails, just, you know, just rubbing right. your shirt. You know, 100,000 words, no bigs, whatever. Well, now look at, look at this, Cece. Uh, I'm a young man, uh, except, you know, I don't look at it anymore. And that was one of the reasons. Um, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really just 35. So I was going to say, because you're younger than Aaron, right? He just yeah. calls you Pops. It's not the real thing. <laughs> it's all fiction and art. <laughs> I'm trying to catch up with your gray hairs, though. I'm, I think, uh, I think I'm, I'm catching up real quick. So. No problem. you got three boys. It would, uh, yeah. It'll catch up quick. <laughs> yeah, it does. So, Molly, what are, what are your thoughts on NaNoWriMo? Well, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Tess DeGroote, who's one of our regular listeners, because she is, and I forget the actual title of it, but she basically runs the local branch for NaNoWriMo. She's involved with um, setting up meet and greets and, and uh, the gatherings and stuff in the month of November, as well as the NaNoWriMo camps that they do, like mini camps in April. So I want to give a shout out to her because I know from talking with her that it's really involved. Um, I did nano once. I will never do it again. <laughs> I agree with both Aaron and Al. It is a lot of pressure. It was a lot of fun, but it is a lot of pressure. And I think if you, if you don't have an actual work in progress, it's good if you want to test your or practice your writing skills. The thing with NaNoWriMo, you have to remember is that when you start it on November 1st, you have so many days and you're throwing in Thanksgiving and holidays and stuff in there. So you have less than 30 days basically to write 50,000 words from start to finish. You're not allowed to go in and copy and paste anything. You have to start with zero content and actually write 50,000 words, not say, well, I had this idea from six months ago and now I'm going to work on it and develop it. You actually have to start from scratch and that's intimidating. 
I I think uh, they could have picked a better month. First of all, pick one with 31 <laughs> days. Why do we have to like, right? Why, why not just move it to February? Who needs those extra two August, days? Those extra three August days? is a good month. There's nothing going on in August. Nothing's oh, happening in I'm August. Sorry. First school, school starts in August, but, well, but yeah, still. but school's in full swing. Like you've got semesters ending pretty soon. And so I don't know who came. I feel like it was kind of an arbitrary. Let's pick November or starts with an N and NaNoWriMo starts with an N. I don't know, anyhow, so. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, I would say definitely give it a try at least once if, you, if, if you're if you a glutton for punishment or for fun, because then you can at least say, at the very least, you can say you tried it, and at the very most, you'll have a completed manuscript. I would just caution you to not think that at the end of NaNoWriMo, you're going to walk away with a professional manuscript. It's going to be a very rough draft, but it is still going to be a completed manuscript if you stick to it. It'll be a good kickstart. Yeah, that'd be one of the things yes. I would I would say that on the positive side of it is the, the number one reason uh, new writers don't get published is they never finish. They just don't finish their work. There's always something else to do. Um, and Why are you looking at me when you say that? I'm not looking at you. I'm actually right now I'm looking at Aaron, but I could switch over to you if you want. <laughs> no, wow. we're good. We're good. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't they don't finish. And when I was leading uh, and directing a writers conference, we try to keep statistics on some of this and we would talk to our agents and editors uh, and we would ask them of the uh, the manuscripts that you requested to see, how many do you see? And we found out that less than half of the people who spent money to be at a writers conference, traveled to be at a writers conference, spent time talking to editors and agents when asked for their manuscript, would not send them in. Mm. That's so sad. you have to ask, well, why, are you, why are you wasting the time and the money? Um, so if, if this kind of thing is what would get you going and get you to finish something, then I'm for it. Hmm. And I'm for Interesting. it. Even Interesting. if you have to double it to make it, uh, say, you know, depending on the genre you're in, but a longer uh, novel, 50,000 is a very short novel. Uh, but, you know, even if... Uh, you had to go back and spend the next few months uh, lengthening it, adding subplots and stuff like that. But if it got that first draft done for you, then that I'm all for. Okay. Um, Tess popped in to the chat room and hey. she says she defines she is the municipal liaison for San Bernardino, for NaNoWriMo. She says we are allowed to do some planning ahead of time and the founders chose November because it's in the Bay Area, and the wet, in the Bay Area where it was founded, the weather is so bad, there's nothing else to do. She's done it eight times, and I admire her for that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What is that, 400,000 words? Yeah, that would be. She's a very, very, uh, she writes all the time. Wow. <laughs> Good for her. Yeah. And... So all the time in November or all the time year round? Well, she's she was in, I let me rephrase that. I was in her critique group. We were all a part of the wordsmiths. And so she is constantly having at least one, one writing project that she's working on, plus two or three more in the wings. As soon as she finishes this, she's working on the next few projects. Good for her. Yeah. yeah I know Tess. I know Tess. So I, I don't doubt that about her at all. Mm -hmm. I know that. She can put words on page, so. Um, well, that's that's amazing. I think we should give her a nickname, something like High Tess. High High Tess. It's 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 a pun. It's you know like a uh, type of gasoline. It's you know like race fuel. Oh, gotcha. Uh, that was the okay. last. It's the last okay. place my mind is going. What was it Robin <laughs> Williams used to say? So this is comedy hell. All right, uh, moving on. <laughs> I, I just I couldn't make the leap with you. I don't I don't watch I, uh, yeah, I didn't auto racing. Get that. <laughs> so, well, I think it's high test is the actual term, but you know, you go. gotcha. Somebody rescue so, me here. Well, uh, we're I, so moving on. How is that? I could go back and rescue? edit that out, but uh, I'm not gonna. I'm Too gonna late. Let that stand. <laughs> <I said laughs> so, too much time. All right. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to uh, dialogue. Now, last week we looked at how to make dialogue uh, sound authentic with, without actually being authentic, and that's a tough line to walk. Today, we're going to talk about the top dialogue killers uh, that writers commit when when doing dialogue. And uh, next week, we'll look specifically at how to tag our dialogue appropriately and efficiently. You'll hear us talk about dialogue tags um, coming up here, but just a quick 
kind of a reminder, dialog tag is sometimes called an attribution. Um, so we'll sometimes say a dialog tag or a dialog attribution, uh, but it's a phrase that tells a reader who's doing the talking. Most commonly, he said, she said, right? I'm going to the beach today, Tom said. Um, in that case, Tom said is an attribution or a tag. Uh, two things to know. Number one, uh, they're very useful when properly used, okay? They, are, they orient your reader so they always know who's speaking, especially if you have multiple people in a room, more than just two people. If you just have two people talking in a room, they're less necessary because we have punctuation to do that job. But the minute you have three people in a room, um, now dialogue tags or attributions become much more important. Um, and they're also overused. And I'm speaking here from personal experience. Um, I, I use them too much. I've been known to use two tags. Now, don't tell anybody this, but since you're our trusted listeners, I've been known to use two tags for the same line of dialogue. She said, blah, 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 she said. Oh, yeah. It's, I go back through my first drafts and I shake my head and I go, this is why I look at these before I send them out to hmm. professionals. <laughs> so uh, it, it's very easy. Um, I use them a lot to add a beat, to add a little bit of time, space, a pause in the dialogue. Um, but you got to be really intentional with those, if that makes sense. Yeah, but let's not confuse the use of beat as you're using it here with something else called a beat, which we'll be talking about, which is a replacement for a tag. So it's, it's a bit of action. Mm -hmm. okay, so, you know, instead of saying Tom said, you'd say Tom, um, you have the dialogue and then Tom frowned mm -hmm. or some kind of action like that. And that's called a beat. So instead of saying he said this, which is obvious, that's really the problem, isn't it, uh, folks? When it's a piece of dialogue, we begin it with a quotation mark, we end it with a quotation mark, so we know something's being said. That's exactly what those quotation marks mean. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you say he said, it's redundant. It's a uh, unneeded words. When you say Tom said, then at least we know Tom is involved with it, but it's it's still the same thing. Or when we do that with the question mark, where are you going? Question mark. He asked. Well, that's what the question mark means. <laughs> okay. So why would you have to say he asked? Um, but every once in a while, you get into a bind where you have to do that. I had to do it a couple times, and there was much gnashing of teeth and sackcloth and ashes. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was horrible. I had to take a nap. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I've always called those, uh, like, things like uh, Tom put on his sandals or Tom frowned. I've always called those action beats. Um, and so I've, I've used that term before, but I've been, I guess, a little more precise with it, the dialogue beat and action beat. Um, but a beat simply just means a, a, a moment of, a moment of action, a moment of dialogue, or in some cases, a cessation of dialogue. But um, that's when in we... film start... scripts, it means there's a pause in the delivery. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I think that's probably where we borrowed the term from as, as writers. Um, and so that's kind of how I've used it. So if you hear us talking about that, we did a whole show on beats, I believe, at one time. I um, believe we did. Probably something called Don't Drop the Beat or something equally punny. <sighs> I'm sorry. That's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, let's talk about some of these mistakes. And I got to tell you that these are really important um, because it's very easy to do dialogue poorly. And if you've got bad dialogue, it will murder the rest of your manuscript. Um, bad dialogue is really, really hard to recover from. Good dialogue, however, will earn you consistent readers. Uh, if you can really handle your dialogue, people will really trust you as a reader. So I think um, there's a bit of a misconception. This isn't on the notes, but I'm just going to throw it out there. I think there's a bit of a misconception among new writers that dialogue isn't important. The dialogue is easy. Uh, I think a lot of people say, oh, well, I wrote I wrote 22 pages today, but, you know, it was all dialogue, so it was easy. Okay. Like, when I hear that, I I cringe a little bit inside because I, I know that of those 22 pages of dialogue, they've got three, maybe four workable pages, and most mm -hmm. of it's going to have to be cut. So if you ever find yourself thinking, oh, dialogue is easy, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> I've been complimented at the risk of sounding really, uh, uh, how you say, uh, narcissistic. I've been complimented several times on my use of dialogue. How do you get your dialogue so crisp, so clean, blah, blah, blah. Um, because it's not easy. 
I, I agonize over it and I pay special attention to it. And I never look forward to writing full pages of dialogue. I never get excited like, oh, it's only dialogue. I always think, oh man, I got to write a conversation here. And there's three <laughs> people. And now there's a fourth person coming in. Like this is excruciating. So just remember that dialogue is hard work. And so here are the things that, that we do in our own writing. Um, specifically, if I could speak for you, Pops, I imagine your answer would be similar. Um, these are things that we pay attention to in our second draft. Again, first draft, you just write it. You're going to write bad dialogue in your first draft. Congratulations. Everybody else does too. Um, second draft, these are the things that we look for in our own writing um, to make sure that it is hitting the marks that we want it to hit. These are the mistakes, the killers that we look for um, so that we don't uh, end up cutting our own feet out from under us. And the first is the over-the-top use of dialogue tags, all right? Um, these really become distracting if you ever pull an errand and use two tags in one line of dialogue. Shame on you. How dare you? <laughs> um, I'm looking at myself in the mirror here. Tisk, <laughs> you know, this tisk, is, tisk. You're right behind me, and I'm just, uh, anyhow. Uh, they become distracting. Remember, what's inside of the quotation marks should be receiving the majority of the attention. Readers care a lot less about things outside the uh, quotation marks. As a matter of fact, that's really used to just set up what's inside the quotation marks. That's where your focus should be. Anything that's distracting from what's inside the quotation marks is going to kill your dialogue. Uh, now, this has changed over time. Poe famously used things like, he gesticulated wildly. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, and, and... That sounds and, offensive. Yeah, <laughs> there's <laughs> lots of that going on. But in his time, sure, that's fine. Um, today's audience very much does not like that. So I think some of the blame can fall on um, uh, the way publishing used to work, and it still works this way sometimes in um, like short story short story world, but they would get paid by the, the word. And if you're getting paid by the word, um, attributions are wonderful little things because even he said is two more words. And so you get a few more cents and you do that over the course of a book and you get lots of extra pizza money doing that. Well, unfortunately, yeah. I think it led to very wooden kind of uh, writing, which you see in the uh, 19th century writing uh, are very long descriptions of scenes and uh, those sorts of things, because they're being paid by the word. So the more words, uh, the more pay they got. When that stopped, uh, then they started cutting like crazy to make things smoother. Uh, and I think that was really a big, uh, a big help to publishing. So I think some of the problem might be there, and the, the, uh, at least in the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, especially in the uh, short fiction side, you were paid by the word, you know, three cents a word, a nickel a word, that kind of thing. Um, are the paperback business, paperback right man, if we want to quote the Beatles here. Nice. Um, yeah, I got to get a Beatle reference in every once in a while. Uh, if you're, you're doing one of those, those guys could knock out half a book in a, ni a night because they were short, but they would, they would salt it with a lot of extra words. Oh, really? He exclaimed wildly and sarcastically. <laughs> um, there, there's an example of... Uh, uh, the dialogue tag that's going over the top here. I also noticed that this is a place where a lot of writers throw in their adverbs. If you do a, a quick analysis of where adverbs pop up, I would say that they disproportionately pop up inside of dialogue tags. Um, he exclaimed sarcastically, those types of things. Uh, so you want to be aware of those and really kind of try and minimize that. Uh, for example, this, this one that we're looking at here, oh, really, he exclaimed sarcastically. Context is going to tell us that the comment is sarcastic right? We get that. You know, yes. he's walking down the street and a car splashes him with a puddle of mud and his girlfriend breaks up with him and he loses his job. Um, and somebody says, how's your day? And he says, oh, it's fantastic. Nobody believes he's saying that honestly. We all know that's sarcastic. We get that. So context is going to give us a lot of the information that we need about how people are saying what they say. So the word exclaimed is too much. And I, I'm going to say this and I always get a lot of pushback. Um, all you really need in your dialogue tags is said and sometimes asked. And that's really about it. People say, but, oh, but, but that's going to get redundant. Well, what happens is the reader actually will ignore those. 
they'll read it, but they don't register it. It all it does is clue them in that so and so said something, but they don't hear it. They don't. It, it the words almost become invisible for them. Mm. Uh, when you're reading it out loud, it becomes more noticeable. But for the most part, said and asked are invisible words, which is good because it keeps the focus on what's inside the quotation mark. Now, if you're ending every line of dialogue with he said, she said, he said, she said, then yeah, that is going to get redundant. But again, you just put them in periodically here and there. And some I, I tend to think the less you put in, the better. Um, so if nothing else, you do want to... Um, avoid overusing those dialogue tags and, and adding in those adverbs and the, um, the verbs that call attention to themselves, like exclaimed and um, shouted and squealed and all of those different ones. Like, again, we just need said and asked, and that's going to do, I'd say, 90% of the work. Let me confess my sin. For a while, I would use he intoned. I it's know. like, I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, did you follow that up with another tag on the same line of dialogue? No, I, I did get a little note from the editor. I said, yeah. stop it. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't do this. Um, you know, but I was learning, so it was, it was early stuff, and that's what you do is you go out and stub your toe a few times, and then um, you learn from it. I'm, I'm, I'm really not a fan of this conversation tonight. But um, anyway, I'm going to go work on my book when we're done here. Um. What you were saying, Aaron, it makes me think what you're always telling me is to trust the reader. The reader is going to be the one to interpret the emotion and the intensity of the dialogue. And so we don't have to tell them how to feel or how to interpret it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, context does that for us. If you're doing your work outside the quotation marks, what's inside the quotation marks works on its own. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, yeah, we'll mention this you know, a little bit later again, uh, probably where you get into trouble is when you have more than, uh, uh, three people talking Then you, you have to have the tags because you don't know who's saying what, even if they speak differently, um, it still gets a little awkward. If you have six, I had six soldiers in the back of a converted UPS truck, um, and they're having to travel the super rough territory. So they're going to talk. And I had to have those scenes in there setting things up. Um, so I probably use more dialogue tags than I normally would. But then again, I was juggling six people making comments. And so I use a lot of beats uh, to get around some of that. Sometimes I'd use their favorite phrases so we would know who. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they're, they do have a place. They're just usually overused. And then there's always the Tom Swifties, right, Pops? <laughs> yeah, uh, those not familiar with Tom Swift, uh, uh, Edward Statemeyer used to write these Tom Swift novels. Uh, uh, well, he had other people writing. He had ghost writers, uh, you know, the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew and all those things were done by teams, uh, that sort of thing. But this became uh, uh, kind of a fun thing to do. And they became known as Swiftyisms. And that's where you have a dialogue tag that has extra meaning to it. It applies to something. So um, uh, you, uh, bingo, Tom said winningly. Uh, yeah. walk this way Tom said stridently um, and, and of course those are done intentionally for the humor please pass me the shellfish Tom said crabbily um, <laughs> you know and there's really just a whole bunch of them and they they, they get hilarious after a while because you're really stretching them uh, to do that now of course a serious writer isn't going to to do that but if I have seen serious beginning writers say uh, pretty ridiculous things in dialogue tags so Use as few as possible. I think that brings us to the general rule. Use as few dialogue tags as possible. Not so few that the reader gets lost or has to work to figure out what's uh, uh, going on or understand who's speaking. That takes him out of the story. So as uh, has been said for many centuries, all things in moderation. Um, use them for a purpose, but use as few as possible uh, unless you're starting to lose someone and then their tools. They're not uh, add-ons. Well, for our new readers, define what is your definition of as few as possible? If okay, you have my, a full page of, because I'm thinking if you have a full page of conversation between just two people, do you, do you omit all of the tags and just let the dialogue run down the page? Or after, not, when do you get the tags on there? No, not 
just blog because then you're it's, it's almost like a, a monologue even though you might have two characters going on it's uh, it's just all words no action so you use the beats or what uh, Aaron would call an action beat so instead of identifying Tom said something Tom does say something it's in quotes so we know he said it but then he does something so you know he, he runs his hand through his hair that's a little cliche but you get the idea he does something he pours himself a cup of tea whatever it might be um, and it's it's usually not much, but it's just a few words that keeps the action going as as well, and makes it visual, just as, and not just auditory. Uh, so my goal is to use as uh, close to zero as possible. Can't do it because uh, sooner or later you'll start losing the reader. So I use them judiciously. Uh, same rule with uh, with the adverbs. Adverbs are not bad. Uh, people say cut out all the adverbs. No, you just cut out the ones you don't need. Uh, if an adverb changes the meaning of the sentence, it's good. So instead of said, saying um, uh, she cried sadly, well, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, if she's crying, she's sad. If um, she cried happily, that says something's kind of weird. Um, or if she smiled sadly, okay, the sadly is doing some work. It's It's toting its own weight there. That makes a difference. It's a perfect good use of that. Uh, so it's the same thing with these dialogue tags that we're talking about. Uh, use them when necessary. Think of them as spice and not the meal. Um, you know, use as few as possible, otherwise they get too noticeable, but make sure that you're still getting the idea across. Most of them are throwaways, like Aaron said, um, but don't even do too much of that. Yeah, I, you said that well, Pops. I've always struggled with how to um, explain to somebody when an adverb is acceptable. Um, but I, I like that if it changes the meaning of the sentence. Um, I've always taught them if the adverb is just changing, if you're using an adverb, it means you're probably using the wrong verb. Um, so you can, I, I really uh, stress that writers should be struggling to find the proper nouns and the proper uh, verbs to right. limit their adjectives and their adverbs. However, uh, go through any book, you're going to find plenty of adjectives and adverbs. And like you say, if it's changing the meaning of the sentence or the the context in which something is read, then yeah, they're doing work. They're putting in their their fair share. Um, so I, I can with that. Thank you for that, Pops. I, something I can now take back, back to you know other students. Well said. Well said. Yeah. Well, let's move on to killer number two. Um, this is formulaic attribution. And what do I mean by formulaic attribution? It means it's following a formula every time you use an attribution. So this is an act of combining dialogue tag with a physical action. And you'll see this a lot, especially among new writers. And we're all guilty of it. All writers did this at the beginning. You know, it's just something you have to, a habit you have to break. But usually uh, it's a tag followed by a present participle. That's a, a verb that's ending in ing or a gerund, which is a noun being used as a, a verb and has an ing ending. So it goes something like this. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, the detective said leaning back in his chair. And then the uh, response to that is, and if I refuse, Roberta said leaning forward. You see that little pattern. So-and-so said and did this. And uh, it is very distracting. It gets noticeable very, very quickly. Uh, and I've seen many, many writers do that really don't need that. You, in fact, in the first line, it, you wouldn't have to say the detective said. Somehow we would already know. We just He leaned back in his chair, and then you also get rid of the weak ing ending uh, at the same time, so you achieve two things there. So the general rule on that is avoid, avoid formula writing, especially in dialogue, so it isn't he said while doing this. Hmm. Usually the giveaway is the ing ending. And there are other forms, uh, formulas that dialogue tags will take. And I, I, um, I think we all kind of form our own. I think we as writers are prone to kind of creating a formula that we like and sticking with it. So we need to be aware of that as well. So Pops, thank you for that. That's a good point, um, I, which I hadn't considered. I hadn't considered about the formulaic uh, forming of dialogue oh, tags. Yeah, I, it happened. I said it, so... Oh, good times. Killer number three is presenting exposition within dialogue. And this is a real pet peeve of mine. So this is simply means that you have to get relevant information to the reader that should not be coming through dialogue. Um, usually this comes out uh, stiff and forced. Your dialogue just feels fake. Um, 
specifically, characters shouldn't say things to other characters who already know it. Um, the, the prime example here comes from Lost, one of my all-time favorite TV shows. Season one was just superb, and you want to study the dialogue in there, study season one all day, up and down, left and right. Skip season three because that was... That was oh, little, goodness, yeah. Is it season three or season four when the writer's strike hit? And uh, oh, yeah. And oh. it showed. It showed. <laughs> I mean, back me up on this, Pops. It was it was gruesome to get through some of those. Uh, there was this one scene where these people parachute onto the island, and they say to these characters out loud with their mouths, <laughs> before she died, she said, tell my sister I love her, but she doesn't have a sister. That was her code that meant somebody killed her. And I know it was you, so now I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was insulted when they said that. Absolutely <laughs> insulted. Like, really? You think I've never watched a television show before? Like, you, first of all, when she delivered the line, it was, tell my sister, I love her. And I was like, that is so ridiculous. <laughs> like, that is awful. So I automatically knew, well, she obviously doesn't have a sister. and, and it was, number one, Molly, you've already mentioned, I, I keep saying trust the reader. The reader's smart. They get it. Um, except except that, for Lost, because you kept telling me, and it's not a reader relationship, but you kept telling me, oh, it gets better. Hang in there. It gets better after season two. And then this happened. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, I would never say it gets better after season two. So somebody that in your family show. told me that, and I was pretty sure it was you. <laughs> oh, no, season one is great. Season two is all right. And, and then after that, you can skip to season six. I still Anyhow, want to know how the polar bear got there. But anyway, move on. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing, the other reason that this, this dialogue is falling apart here is because it's like the villain monologuing. And I just love the Incredibles when they call attention to that. Like, you caught me monologuing. You know, the villain saying all their evil world plans because, or evil plans to take over the world because the reader needs to know that. But ask yourself, what villain would actually pause and not kill the hero when they have the opportunity just to reveal their whole sordid plan and then foul up the, the killing of the hero? It doesn't happen. Stop it. Um, if you've done that, <laughs> stop it. Um, <laughs> You know, things like, hey, Frank, you know how you're scared of the dark, right? And also, you've always dreamed of becoming a professional ballerina? Well, I just want to let you know that's cool. Oh, what? Why? You, why would you say that to somebody who already knows it? Like, that's just... <laughs> it feels so fake. And it's, it's as a reader, that's when I, I kind of close the book. And I'm, you know what? I, I think I'm done with this book. Um, you... Find the other way. Use exposition properly outside of the quotation marks. What's inside the quotation marks is only what people would actually say. With a little bit of editing so that it sounds authentic without actually being authentic. For the most part, skip it. Just if the exposition is outside the quotation marks. So the general rule then is... Avoid using dialogue to salt information about the story. Yeah. Number four, thinking every bit of dialogue needs a tag. It doesn't. The goal is to keep the reader informed, the story moving. So use, as we said earlier, use as little uh, as possible. With that, uh, when there's a group, as we talked about, it gets a little confusing, so you're going to have to be a little more creative. Uh, but not every bit of dialogue needs a dialogue tag. So general rule, use as few tags as possible and only when needed for clarity. Hmm. Absolutely. And killer number characters speaking too directly. Um, people rarely are specific when it comes to difficult topics. I've seen this a lot. Uh, they tend to talk around things. They tend to speak in euphemisms. If you've got something like a divorce coming up, uh, if my friend's going through a divorce, I'm not going to be like, how are the divorce proceedings coming along? I might just say something a little more vague, like, you know, how was court today? Or, you know, um, did you get to see your kids? Um, something like that. The, the example I always use is, hey, Phil, how's your mom who's dying of stage four cancer? 
Like, I think I actually read that in somebody's story once. And I was like, what? Oh, like, goodness. first of all, um, if I'm Phil, I'm punching that man in the face. Uh, <laughs> secondly, unless he's got some sort of disease where he can't help it. But for the most part, like, <laughs> nobody's going to say that. Why did you put that in quotation marks? Because you wanted the reader to know that Phil's mom is dying of stage four cancer. Again, exposition inside the quotation marks. You need to avoid that. Exposition comes outside. Instead, and again, trust the reader. Readers are smart. Um, use the euphemism. All you need to say is somebody says, hey, Phil, how's your mom? Right? And then Phil's response is, chemo's brutal. That's it. That's all we need to know. But we need to know it's in stage four. No, we don't. You said chemo. I know what chemo means. Um, that's it. And that's all you want. So general rule, uh, just keep the, the dialogue as an opportunity to reveal the character, not the plot. Does that make sense? Reveal yes. the character, not the plot. Yeah, and if you do need to know, if the reader does need to know that it's a stage four cancer, you don't do it in dialogue like that. The doctor might tell somebody it's stage four cancer. The uh, mother might say it's stage four cancer. Uh, but the buddy coming over isn't going to say, hey, how's that stage four cancer going? Um, mm. Makes him look cold and uh, it's just not the way to go. So I think you're absolutely correct on that one. Mm. So number seven, you got something in here about talking through your smiles. Yeah. Did we skip six? Oh, wait, our we six? six? I, I skipped six. I pushed it up too far there. Yeah. Uh, killer number six, <laughs> depending too heavily on tags instead of narration, and uh, or dialogue to paint action um it's it's easier to write he said than it is to write a, a more active scene uh a, a little better narration to, to tug at the heart and get into the minds of uh, of individuals so uh dialogue tags should uh, again only be used when needed um and not uh, uh as a shortcut to getting to some other point in the story Hmm. Now number and, seven. Now number seven. And this kind of plays in with what you're saying. Um, in our attempts to use dialogue attributions and tags and, and specifically beats or action beats, um, and we don't want to keep saying things like he said, she said, asked, etc. So we'll say things like he smiled, he moaned, he fumed, he chuckled. Um, but what happens is that becomes very awkward. Like, we can moan words, sure. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of teenage girls and boys who do moan words. Mom. Um, <laughs> oh but at some point, it's, it seems really melodramatic and juvenile. Um, and so if you have an adult moaning a word, it, mm, it, no, please don't. <laughs> um, and smiling words, okay. it's good to see you. <laughs> He smiled. Like, that's weird. Like, people that do that have no friends. Um, you know, or, Shut up! Or <laughs> it's good to see you. He chuckled. Okay. Like, chuckle once and then say something, or say something and then chuckle. The way you fix that is you just, at the end of the dialogue, you put a period instead of a comma. Okay, so instead of it's good to see you, comma, he chuckled, it's simply, it's good to see you, period. He chuckled. I don't know why he's chuckling at that point, but just imagine it was funny. Um, and so that's an easy fix, but just think about it. Is, are the words coming out of their mouth as they're performing this action? If so, you're probably okay. If not, maybe you need to change it, right? Um, so these words are really, they become like the action beats rather than simply attribute tags, if that makes sense. Uh, so really, you just want to keep your attributions simple. The simpler, the better. Again, when they're simple, they become invisible, which keeps the focus on what's inside the quotation marks. There you go. Nice. So just a sideline here again. Are you saying, if I'm interpreting correctly, there's a difference between a tag and a beat? They're two separate things. A tag would be necessarily sort of like the comma, so it goes along with it, where the beat is a period and it's a separate action. Uh, without getting too far into it, um, they, just say yes. That's correct. The tags can be used as beat. So a square is always a rectangle. A rectangle is not always a square. Oh, great! So moving they, on. Boy, we just slipped into geometry. I, 
I'm trying to describe the relationship here. So a tax We are your full service fiction writing place. <laughs> tax, you know, tax can be used as beats, but they're not always beats. Like specifically how Pops uses beat, it's an action beat. Um, it's, a, it's a break in the dialogue. Um, the example I always give comes from a, a story I wrote called Leaving Tennessee, which is inside the bargain. If you want to buy that book, it's a great book. It'll change your life. It's available on Amazon. Uh, but in it, it's like, you don't even need me anymore. You're doing all your own promos. Um, there's a scene in which, uh, somebody says, you know, you can never get out of this town. And somebody says, well, you got out of this town. Um, and he says, and now I'm right back here. The response is just for tonight. And then his response is just for tonight. He said, sure. Or something like that. Just for tonight. He said, sure. And what that does is it gives that pause between the two things that he says. And I wanted that pause there. So I put the he said inside, not inside the quotation marks, but I, I stopped the quotation marks, put it in between the two things that he said, just to emphasize that there's a bit of a pause here without having to say he paused. So you can use them that way. They're not always used that way, especially when they come at the beginning or at the end. Um, that's usually just for identifying um, who's speaking. Did that answer? In the context of dialogue, uh, a beat is, something where uh, is an action the character takes and it rep that identifies that that's the person that's speaking. So it replaces a dialogue tag or an attribution. In a sense, it's a different form of attribution. So somebody does an action, you know, he takes off his cap or whatever, but you don't need the he said, she said, or anything like that. Now that's the more basic, uh, you know, it's straight to the point kind of thing is that a beat really, really is more action. Uh, a tag is just simply he said, she said, exclaimed whatever the, okay. yeah the, yeah the tag is that's all it does its only function is to identify speaker whereas beats can do more than that they identify the speaker and give more information so thank you well said pops thank you um killer number eight using lines simply to advance another character's speech uh the reason this is offensive is because it's they're completely unrelevant they're empty hollow words um take them out how has your story changed it's not useless, useless dialogue. Um, Pops, I think you actually call them weasel words. Weasel words, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's, here's the perfect example. Really, and then what happened? <laughs> well, what? Okay, so really, then what? So that's four words doing absolutely nothing. Instead, I take that out and I let the guy who's speaking continue speaking, right? Uh, if you want a break, if you feel like there needs to be a break because it's a really long paragraph that they're retelling this whole backstory, give us a little bit of action. Have them pour a cup of coffee. Um, just watch Civil War, Marvel's or Captain America Civil War again. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Tony Stark is is getting ready to go into his big monologue. And, you know, I've just got a nursing an electromagnetic headache. Who's putting coffee grounds in the garbage disposal? Am I running a bed and breakfast for a biker gang? <laughs> He kind of continues on. So like he's making coffee and he's doing things while he's speaking. Um, so, but nobody says, and then what happened, Tony? He just says what he needs to say. As a matter of fact, he puts up a picture of a kid and nobody says anything. And he says, oh, that's Charlie Spencer, by the way, blah, blah, blah. Perfect. Nobody said anything. We didn't need anybody to say anything. We just needed Tony to continue talking. So throwing in a, a little bit of action um, as a beat, can help do that. Um, throwing in a little bit of uh, interior monologue, perhaps, to help us orient the reader as to the character's state of mind, um, their emotions, etc. Uh, but basically, you want to avoid any line of dialogue that is artificial, that it's unrealistic, and that it's specifically that it's just unnecessary. You want to avoid those. Uh, we got two more. But go ahead, Pops. Yeah, I was going to say what what's happening there is the writer's gotten concerned that the uh, the reader's going to forget the other character. And so they have them say something. Okay. And that's an unrealistic fear. You can have them just react to something that's said. Uh, oh, yuck. And then, and then move on. Uh, don't use the other character as a prompter. Good. Well yeah. said. Yeah, you can, you can simply give them an action, right? If you want to remind the characters. Because I guess if you've got like 15 people in a room and you're afraid that they're going to forget that this character is there and important, let that character say something relevant or... Let them, you know, ask a pertinent question or do something pertinent. Um, 
that's that's would be the way to do it. I I, I would suppose. Uh, going kind of quickly here as we are up against the clock. Killer number nine. People speaking in unison. So yes, this does happen in real life. Otherwise, my sons would never say jinx, roof pop, jinx, pinch poke, yo me a coke, blah blah blah. Like, that <laughs> wouldn't happen. So people actually say things at the same time. I get it. Um, but unless it's at a surprise party, it just doesn't happen often. And it's almost impossible to do in fiction to make it feel natural. Um, and I know somebody mm -hmm. listening right now is, oh, I can do it. Okay, you know, take that as a challenge, fine. But <laughs> why? Well, if, that's the, if that's your whole goal is to prove me wrong, uh, hooray for you. But I would write for a larger purpose myself. Um, it feels really, really forced. And what does it add to the story that two people said something at the same time? Does it add anything at all? I don't think that it does. Uh, here's an example. Black Widow is my favorite Avenger. She's so strong and awesome and I love her. I want to be her. They simultaneously exclaim together at the same time. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That hurts. <laughs> right. And, and we've got like multiple sentences to think that two people are going to say that much at the same time is ridiculous. No. Um, even at a surprise party, we can't get everyone to say surprise at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> So, so surprise, surprise. Yeah, you just want to avoid that. Um, there's no real reason for it. So trying to convey people speaking uh, in unison on the page, it's tough to do. It's better if you just avoid it. Um, even if it sounds right in your head, it's probably not going to seem right to the reader. Um, with rare exception, but we could say that for everything. For the most part, uh, avoid that. Um, there you go. Yeah, otherwise, you could end up with a tag that said, Sally said, Fred said, she said, all in the same line. Oh, goodness. Now I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my challenge. All right. I'm going to do it. We're up to number 10, our last one. Um, I think we're up to number 10, aren't we? Yeah. We are. Last one. Yes, sir. Uh, so killer number 10 is this, trying too hard to show accents, brogues, socially unique um, speaking patterns. Uh, sometimes we think we need to capture every intonation, every change, every clipped word, every um, accent, uh, and that can get very difficult to put on a page because it may sound right in your head and you put it on the page, it does not mean the reader is going to be able to hear it. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't clip a few words, it doesn't mean you shouldn't use some uh, colloquialisms, that you shouldn't use um, some accent, but if you try to spell them all out, uh, it gets where you, sometimes you can't even read the sentence. And that's a mistake. You've now lost your reader. And the point is to convey the story to the reader. So if you're doing things to drive them away, well, that's just never good. Um, so, and there's only so much torturing of words you can do to get the accent to come across on the, on the page. So now I've had to deal with this several times. I've had, to, I, I remember I had a, one of the bad guys in one of my earlier stories um, was what amounts to an Irish mobster, you know, and so he's got a, he's got a heavy brogue. And I gave it a shot or two to try to get the accent in uh, exactly as he would say it, and it would not work on the page. So I just dropped in a few things that he would say, boyo, and a couple of other things that might be common to him. And that was it. And I would just say, uh, I think I'd have one line that, was, that he said in, his, uh, in a thick brogue, and then I'd have him say something, and that's it. And the reader will uh, do something that's remarkable. Once they know that, they will start reading each of his lines with that brogue. Mm -hmm. okay. So you give them enough to get them started uh, and to keep it real and also to help you get rid of some uh, tags um, because that person's speech is going to be different enough that you don't necessarily have to say who it was that said it because you can read it, you can see it. Uh, so the general rule on all of that is just simply when doing unusual dialogue, write like a reader. Never forget your reader. It's no good being clever if no one knows what you're doing. Hmm. Well said, I just finished reading a book where there was a, a couple Scottish characters and they tried to spell it out phonetically. And it's like, I'm having to go back to Hooked on Phonics here to try and figure out what they're <laughs> trying to say. And it's, you know, I don't, I don't need a reference book next to me when I'm trying to read your story. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So it it's, um, doesn't work as well to these days. Of course, there's always a counterexample. Everyone's well, Huck Finn was written in dialect. Yeah, yeah we're not Mark Twain. Um, <laughs> and but even then, he didn't. I, it wasn't all dialect. He did enough so you could sense what it's an uneducated boy on the Mississippi would sound like, 
or uh, what a slave like Jim would sound like uh, or what Aunt Polly would sound like. Um, but even then, they were fairly well-known terms at the time. Git, G-I-T, mm-hmm. uh, you know, get going and uh, those sorts of things. But most of it was uh, uh, syntax that he would change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you got the real, real sense then of that. The, ch- the ordering of the words, the way that yeah. or- the words are put together in a sentence. Yeah. Um, and, and that book is a lot easier to read when you do it out loud and to understand when you read it out loud. Um, if you just try and read it in your head, it it's, does not always translate. And it can be a real challenge, uh, especially to students in 11th grade, which is typically where they're going to be reading that. Um, so our current... I rule in publishing is to avoid that when possible. Um, again, pops, as you say, use the colloquialisms that they're going to use some of their sayings, um, syntax, you can alter syntax a little bit if you need to. Um, but for the most part, just play it pretty close to the best. The other problem that you can fall into with that is, is becoming, um, stereotypical and racist, um, yeah. which I've seen. I just watched a movie in which case, I was thinking the whole time, I was like, wow, this dude is just a stereotype and everything he says is totally racist. And it's really weird. They did that with Mark Twain's uh, books for a while. And I think you can still get them. There's some where they, uh, they took out some of the racial epithets. Hmm. Mark, and Mark Twain's, one of his primary goals in writing that book was uh, to show how evil slavery was. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's interesting that they were trying to clean up the guy who was trying to clean up the situation. Mm-hmm. I did hear a great story about Mark Twain uh, that I hadn't heard before. You know, he was almost killed in a duel. No. I, a, I think I did hear something about that. Tell the story. He got, an, uh, he got into a tiff. You know, he was used to be really acerbic uh, with another editor, and the other editor replied, and then the editor challenged him to a duel. Unfortunately, Mark Twain couldn't shoot straight. So his second, the guy that would go with him, took him out to teach him how to shoot because he was a good shot. Mark Twain couldn't hit a tree. <laughs> so his second uh, asked for the gun, and as a bird was flying by, uh, he held up the pistol and shot the head off the bird in flight. Uh, and just as that happened, uh, the other editor was going to be part of the duel, and his second showed up. And the, the other second asked, <laughs> who shot the bird? Mark Twain's second said, well, Mark Twain did. He can do it three out of four times. <laughs> and there was a sudden change of heart. <laughs> Oh, Three God. out of four times, the guy couldn't hit the tree the bird was in. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fantastic. We, yeah, we owe that little bit of that little bit of history. Uh, uh, some <laughs> we need to be thankful for that little bit of history because we ended up with Mark Twain alive. Good. good. That's good to know. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that is good to know, and it's it's good that he survived. Hooray for that! So, um, general rule: uh, always have a good second. Is yep. <laughs> general rule. Yeah. <laughs> Win in a duel, have a better shooting second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Molly, do we have any comments or questions from the chat room tonight? Yes. Um, we were talking at the beginning of the show, and oh, see, now it bumped all the way down. Hold on. I had it. Becky had a question when we were talking about books. She says, Can we give some examples of books and authors with great dialogue? Dean Koontz does a great job with dialogue. Stephen King does a terrific, albeit rather uh, colorful, um, has lots of colorful metaphors. And And by colorful, you mean? um, Yeah. uh, (laughs) Colorful. (laughs) Colorful. Sailor talk. Peel the paint off the wall kind of language that he would use, but he defines his characters that way. but, you know, no matter how rough is the language gets that he uses in his dialogue, it always sounds real. Hmm. Um, so uh, I think he's a master of dialogue. Dean Koontz also. Um, I'm, I would add Cormac McCarthy. And know, again, yeah. content warning, Cormac McCarthy is phenomenal. Tim O'Brien is just unbelievable uh, with his dialogue. Um, those two are the first ones that come to mind um, right now. Uh, Flannery O'Connor. Oh, man. Yes. Henry O'Connor. Whew. Um, you know, I wish I had a typewriter that she used to use. 
if Thank only. You. Yeah, if only Gosh. I do. That's in my Go classroom. Away. I don't know if I showed you, Pops. I, I put it in my classroom. I got it all set up. My son likes to type on it and jam it because that's what good sons do. So Yeah. For those who uh, have not, no idea what we're talking about, I gave um, Aaron a typewriter that was very similar to the kind of typewriter that Flannery O'Connor used. Uh, I think so, it was a Royal Model O or Model P, something mm -hmm. like that. So I've got my little Flannery O'Connor shrine set up with it. So all my pictures <laughs> were surrounding it and all that good stuff. So yeah, Cormac McCarthy, uh, Tim O'Brien, Dean Kuntz, Stephen King. Um, I would definitely hold them up as good examples. So um, Janet Ivanovich, I haven't read much of her, but I feel like I read something of hers and was really impressed as well. Um, if you like kind of the mystery type stuff. So there's that. Any other questions, comments, concerns? A comment from Tess. She said she has asked readers. Um, she says she has alpha readers. I'm trying to read what is she, I think there's a typo in here. Anyway, she says um, readers have asked, you want to change said and asked for other words, but sometimes those other words draw too much attention to the words themselves. Mm -hmm. So they take... I guess I think what she's trying to say is if you say he blah, 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 what are you doing? He asked, as opposed to what are you doing? He shouted profanely. It's the profanely then that's going to have the focus instead of the question mm -hmm. is what she says. Even a shouted, but if you're having the kind of quick dialogue that goes back and forth, you can end up with too many uh, dialogue tags. And that may be what um, the critique group is talking about. So it, it doesn't hurt to mix them up a little bit. I wouldn't use anything flashy, you know, uh, occasionally uh, I'll write that he remarked uh, if I thought the word said appeared too many times on the page. Um, I will use he asked, but I hate it because that's what the question mark means. Um, mm. You know, but sometimes I have to identify the character. Fortunately, it doesn't happen too often where I can't come up with a solution. Um, so that's okay to do. But if you do too many, then it, that becomes an item in itself that the reader will notice. Okay. Definitely keep a lookout for that. I think the easiest solution to that is just to take out some of the saids and the asked, just some of the tags. You can probably get rid of them. Um, yeah, and use those, use those action beats. And one way you can find those is most computers will read to you. Uh, I have my computer reading me all the time, and it's because I will hear a problem before I'll see it. Mm-hmm. And I will notice when I'm, I'm listening to a page as it's reading back to me, uh, that I may have the word said too many times. If I keep hearing the same word over and over, I go back and change the word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes we will hear what we cannot see. Mm -hmm. That's true. Sounds like um, an Al's axiom. I, I know. I mean, I was just thinking I'm going to have to put that up there. Uh, basically, the general consensus is that this chat room in this format is really good. The chat runs very smoothly. Like Tess was saying, we're not all getting alerts on our phones just because we signed up once for the Google Plus Hangouts. So that's going to be very helpful. We started a discussion about Lost, so we're just going to ignore that and keep moving on. <laughs> and then just conversations um, support. Tess is supportive. Um, affirming basically everything you guys were saying. She said the one thing is speaking in unison so, for example, having a group of boys say cool when presented something with something gross mm -hmm. or dangerous would work and feel natural. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think what, what you were saying earlier, you don't want an entire sentence or conversation to work in unison because that is difficult. And it's possible that all of them would say cool, but it's more likely that one would say cool and one would say whoa and one would say awesome and one would say rad and one would say totally tubular because I'm sure we're doing an 80s piece here. Um, and you know, somebody else would say stop, stop now. <laughs> yeah, so i uh, still be leery of even just the one word response, even though one word response would be easier to swallow. Um, personally, I'd still permit, but that's just me. Okay. I did want to add one last list, uh, one name to the list of great dialogue writers. Uh, that's that's Gansky. Uh, it's really, really good at it. I'm not going to tell you which one. Um, I'll just let you buy all of our books. Well, we all know who you're talking about. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, they have to buy all your books and all my books to figure it out. So um, there you go. Uh, anything else, Molly? No, that'll do it for this evening. All right. Well, 
Uh, I'm glad that we got this working. It seems like we're getting some of the technical issues worked out. I'm excited about that, excited about moving forward. Make sure you come back here. Same address as tonight, aaronganski.com slash firstsinfictionlive with all of your hyphens in there. Uh, we'll be back here next week talking about how to beat attribute tags since we've talked about how evil they are tonight. Next week, we'll give you some pointers on how to fix those. Don't forget to ask the author. You can do that via email here on aaronganski.com. Just click on the contact link there at the top of the page, or you can do it through Facebook or through Twitter. Uh, you can always find Pops at altongansky.com. You can find them all, frankly, my dear, mojo.com, and you can find me right here at aaronganski.com. Thank you so much for listening, and until next week, 